Okay, well thank you all very much indeed for coming along this lunchtime to our fringe Free to Sip Seed, Will School Autonomy Lead to School Improvement? I'm Natalie Evans and I'm Deputy Director at Policy Exchange. Um, and we're delighted to be holding um, a fringe on this as education re reform is in fact one of, well, from our perspective, one of the most radical aspects of the coalition's agenda and has the potential to fundamentally change our education system and obviously have significant impacts on schools, their pupils and their teachers. So to discuss issues around how these new freedoms will actually lead to improvements and if they will, I'm um, delighted to welcome our panel with us today. First of all, we have Rachel Wolf, who is founder and director of the New Schools Network. On the end there, we've got John Housen, who's managing director of Education Data Services and on authority um, on the labour market for teachers. On the end down there, we've got Kate Edwards, who's head of school improvement at Pearson. And we're delighted to welcome Duncan Holmes, who since May has been MP for Chippenham and is a current school governor, so has some experience himself of life in schools. So we're going to kick off, um, each of the panellists will speak for a short while and then we'll obviously open up to questions and answers. So I'm going to hand over to Rachel. Thank you. Um, I have a very short but dual message, which is I think freedoms can bring enormous opportunities, particularly for the poorest in this country. We have a horrendous dual system at the moment in which the wealthier in society can make sure they can effectively buy their way into a good school place, whether that is through paying for independent school fees in the small 7% of the population, or far more commonly by being able to buy a house in the right catchment area to make sure that you can get to a good school, while the poorest are too often stuck. And I think that allowing people to start new schools and giving schools more freedom will allow those pupils to have opportunities that they're currently completely deprived of. However, I think autonomy on its own is not going to achieve that. And one of the key lessons from abroad when you look at people who have allowed people to start new schools, which have given schools more freedom, is that you really do need accountability to go with that freedom. Um, so first of all, what, what are the advantages of autonomy? Uh, I set up uh, my charity, which helps people set up new schools, after meeting a large number of astonishing and inspirational people in America who have set up new schools, the majority of whom are teachers and often quite young teachers. Uh, so for example, uh, I met a couple of 28-year-olds uh, originally 28 year olds who uh, set up a single school in Houston who now run over 80 schools across the states called the KIPP schools and which are taking children from the most deprived areas usually from black and Hispanic backgrounds and where they were before probably have been more likely to go to jail than to college they are now getting into Ivy League universities and really getting opportunities that they've completely deprived of um, for these schools set up. And when you talk to those teachers, uh, the sort of message that often comes across is how depressed many of them have been teaching in inner cities um, before they were given this chance. And that's partly because of the, often the leadership of those schools, but it's also because of the amount of prescription that they were under and the extent to which they felt they knew how they could make a difference, they weren't being allowed to make that difference. Um, one of the things that the Charter School Programme, which is now probably the key element of Obama's education drive, has done is allow teachers like that to go and make a bigger difference in areas where before they couldn't. Um, it's it's reprofessionalised them. It has made it it has made it more likely that teachers will stay in the workforce because they feel that there is that opportunity, and it's beginning to motivate more people to come into the workforce to get uh, um, in the first place. It's been very very tied up with the Teach for America program, which is a fantastic Teach First in this country, so modelled on. And people who've come through that program have increasingly taken up that opportunity to go and set up child schools and work in them. But one of the things that you learn when you look at the states and, and the United States is a fantastic opportunity for us because with everything they always have 50 different ways of doing everything. Um, because the states all have different laws, they all have different regulations. What a charter school is, is different in each one of those states. If you look at places like New York or Boston or Chicago, as I've said, charter schools have completely transformed standards. They've massively reduced the gap between rich and poor and they have given many teachers opportunities to make that difference that they didn't otherwise have. But if you look in other states, that hasn't happened. And there have been, while there have been a large number of new schools, they haven't improved standards in the way that you would have hoped, whatever the motivations of people setting up were. And there have been a number of people who've looked at the differences between them. And the key difference is accountability. Uh, what does that mean? It means three things. Uh, first of all, that when you are asking someone whether they want to set up a school, you really test whether they've thought it through. This isn't someone coming up and saying, I think this is quite a nice idea. You say, okay, here's hundreds of thousands of taxpayers' money. 
It's making sure that they thought through everything from the organizational aspects, which is what we help with. So sites, have you thought through budgets, have you sorted out your <coughs> governance structure, have you sorted out your legal structures, through to really thinking through the curriculum, how you are going to make sure that the people that you are working with are going to be helped. And one of the things that I think is really, really fantastic about child schools is you're increasingly getting people thinking about precisely what kind of curriculum and teacher structures helps with different kinds of deprived pupils and even setting up their own teacher training colleges to train people how to do that. Um, so it's, it's the plan and not being prescriptive and precisely what they teach, allowing that innovation, but making sure that they've thought it through and that it's come from the base of evidence and that people want to send their child to that school. So that's the first part. Um, the second part is, is inspecting those schools and uh, one of the things that I think is very interesting about the states is the increasing use of effectively local authorities and universities to be the organisations which can authorise these schools and inspect how they're doing well. They're not the only people who can do it. So for example, if you are in New York, you can apply to the state of New York, the city of New York, or the state university of New York, all of which are allowed to decide whether you can sell the school and then monitor how well you're doing it. I think that would be an interesting role for local authorities potentially in the future. So inspecting that, and again, not prescribing what you do, but looking to see how well you are doing it. Are children benefiting? And then third, um, and, and the evidence in this really is quite stark, is if you are willing to say to a school, if you don't do well enough, if you're not getting good results for your children, if they're not getting the right qualifications, if they're not going on to university, if they're not doing well in tests, you will not get to stay at school. That's always difficult, but it really is the difference between a system which massively improves standards for the poorest, uh, which gives a route for some of the best and most exciting teachers and other people to go into education to make a bigger difference, um, and one which has some new schools with successes, but also has too many that are failures. So that's my message, really. Um, we desperately need new schools which are going to help you with these backgrounds because they are not getting the kind of education that they deserve and need. We need to find a way of giving these fantastic teachers, and I'm talking now to an enormous number in England who want to do this, um, that opportunity. But the government does also need to hold them to account. Great. Thank you very much, Rachel. John? Thanks very much. I mean, that's, you didn't say I wasn't a Democrat. Well, I think most people in the audience know that. Um, yes, I think that where we've got common ground is quite simple. We want to ensure that the, the divided society we've got in this country, the lack of social mobility, the inability of many children to actually make use of the opportunities that the education system can provide for them, actually works. And what I was sort of trying to work out what to say on this, I sort of also thought the big problem is that you have to do it within some sort of framework. And Rachel's been very good on the, the visionary aspect. Um, and I thought of John Dunn's quote about nobody is an island. And I also thought about John Mill's view of education, which is that it's the responsibility of the state to see that its citizens are educated, not necessarily to educate them itself. And of course, the state system in this country is the default system. You are entitled to educate your children how you like in this country. But if you don't do it, the state will do it for you. And that state schooling has always been provided by a whole range of different bodies. Uh, most notably the faith groups, but London livery companies, whole raft of charities, uh, and more recently, Academy sponsors. Well, I have to say, I was disappointed to read the National Audit Office report suggesting that 74% of those haven't put any money in. Um, and the, the whole notion of the fact that there is an interrelationship between the component parts of the system is particularly important at the present moment in time, where we have a secondary school population which across most of the country is falling. Uh, in parts of the North East, they will lose one in 12 pupils between 2010 and 2015. But we've got a primary school population which is rising. And the number of children coming into our, many of our schools in many of our areas is increasing and will increase over the next few years. And there's a very interesting document which deserves to be better known, which was the, the planning document for school places across London which came out in 2004, and it was designed by the 33 London boroughs. So that's Liberal Democrat, Labour, and Conservative authorities. And it said that if you create too many extra places within the system, 
you will enter into a spiral of decline in which some schools will permanently carry a level of vacancies that oblige them to admit an undue proportion of casual admissions that are children excluded from other schools. As a result, their examination results will go down, they will become more unpopular, they may have difficulty recruiting and retaining staff, and may ultimately close. By definition, this will happen in an unplanned way, possibly over a number of years, by which time the children attending those schools are unlikely to have had a good experience. Now, philosophically, I don't mind who runs a school, providing they understand what they are doing, and providing it is needed. And we can debate amongst ourselves what the best size for a school is in both economic and human scale terms. Indeed, I wrote some years ago, I thought it was perfectly reasonable, and I gave Rachel this quote a little last time we met, that, that teachers as professionals should behave like other professionals and run their own businesses, you know, run their own schools. But implicit in the title of the session is that autonomy must lead to improvement. And as far as I'm concerned, we must be looking to improve education, not for some, but for all. And we've got to make sure that we have a system that doesn't allow some people who can use their social capital to gain further improvements. And Rachel doesn't want that, to be fair, and everything she said was against that. But you've only got to look at some of the schools that are in that first list where they're located, who the, the, the foundation governors are to ask yourself about the issue of social capital. There's also the problem of how do you keep some schools where parents have got a particular, or a group have got a particular type of education in mind when the original sponsors move on? Is it about creating a model, like the KIPP schools, that will then be transferable across a large number of areas and become dynamically improved in those? Or is it about letting a bunch of individuals, whether they're parents or others, who want a Montessori school or even a monitorial school, to actually set that up and what happens when they move on? St all these schools, in my view, must justify their existence as part of a wider system. And that system includes not just the buildings, but the teachers, the curriculum, and the common purpose of education funded by the state, because <coughs> it's the default system. Otherwise, what we're doing is funding private education uh, on the state. And if, if we do that and don't draw the legislation up, and I'm quite interested to know whether there are lawyers already pouring over the Academies Act to see whether or not you can actually use the Human Rights Act uh, and the clause on education to use the Academies Act to say, well, if you're going to fund these sorts of schools, then why aren't you funding my school? Now, the cost of that, I worked out some years ago, would be about three billion pounds. And we clearly can't afford that in the current age of austerity. Even in an age of affluence, there might be too many competing claims on, on the government purse. So what I basically have no problem with is the basic philosophy that we need to find a way of improving the education bits of the system that are failing. I'm slightly worried that what we're moving towards is what, when I did basic <coughs> economics 101, was the difference between demand and effective demand. And I assume they teach that on PPE courses at Oxford, where most of the cabinet can win. Um, you know, I would like a Ferrari or a low, uh, Aston Martin, but I can't afford it. I would like everybody to go to a really brilliant school. And I want to be able to afford that, and I want the mechanism that achieves that. And one of the things we want to debate is, is this going to be the way to achieve it? What I do want in terms of autonomy and what I do subscribe to are professionals able to teach how they wish, providing they deliver results within acceptable social and legal norms, and recognising that all pupils, regardless of intelligence or background, require and deserve a first-class education system. <coughs> that there is a choice of schools by parents and pupils where possible, but that a pupil premium funding model based upon need funds effective learning. And finally, please to end the current and long-standing uncertainty between central and local government about who is actually taking the strategic decision on education in this country. Because for a Secretary of State to ring up 
the local authority and say, I've just approved a school in your area without any reference to your strategic plan seems to me to be a good way of collapsing the present <coughs> education system. But in the end, the improvement comes down to one thing. It doesn't matter what the buildings are like, it doesn't matter what the people are like, it matters about the people. And it's the people that's at the bottom of it. And for most of the last 20 or even 30 years, we have not had, let alone good people, not enough people coming into teaching to teach our children. And the schools that have suffered because of that are the very ones that you want to help. Thank you very much, John. Hand over now to Kate. Um, I'd like to start by apologising uh, for Anders Holton's absence. I'm afraid he's been taken down with a severe case of man flu. He gave me about two hours' notice that I was going to be giving this presentation this morning. So I've put together um, quite, a, quite a structured uh, a piece to, to sort of convey some of the ideas that we've been working on. But I think that's the teacher in me coming out, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, my uh, current role is Head of Development for School Improvement at Pearson. Um, but I come to this role from having gained experience in a wide variety of other educational contexts. Um, I've had held lectureships at the universities of Cambridge and Aberystwyth. I have worked for the Villas Park Education Trust, both on their teacher courses, reinvigorating teacher knowledge and pedagogy, and also in terms of their talent, uh, courses for talented and gifted 16 to 19 year olds that try and encourage underprivileged kids to apply to university. And I've also um, recently, my most recent post was with GEMS Education, a private education provider. So my knowledge and experience spans higher education, private education, and uh, also state education. So that's really my background. Um, I think that everyone here would agree that the previous government put a huge amount of money into um, investment in education, particularly in terms of buildings and facilities, and also in terms of stimulating and growing interest in leadership and teaching through the Teach First program. Um, but given this massive focus, the question that remains really is, is why are some schools better than others? And, and you know, how do you really improve outcomes in schools? So what I'm going to talk to, uh, to you about today is a third piece of the puzzle that I've been grappling with, which I think it's necessary for us to deal with um, if uh, schools are really going to have autonomy and continue to have a positive impact on outcomes. And this piece of the puzzle is what I want to call knowledge transfer and the importance of knowledge transfer in schools and the role it plays in improving outcomes. But first, what I think I'll probably do is put Pearson in a bit of context and explain perhaps what we bring to the table in terms of uh, these wider discussions. So Pearson is probably most well known to most of you for its businesses, um, Penguin, The Financial Times and Dorlin Kindersley but we have a footprint in many other aspects of education. And this is part of a wider strategy that um, has been implemented in the, in the company over the last seven years. And uh, we now span an interest in, in other publishing areas such as Longman, Heinemann and Prentice Hall. Uh, many of you, if you have a teaching background, may have come into contact with Pearson through edXL by selecting that as an exam board or indeed encouraging your pupils to take BTEC uh, qualifications. Pearson also has a, a new and is a growing footprint in the arena of education technology. And so we've got um, uh, an interest in learning platforms, management information systems, and diagnostic tools that help pupils and can help target uh, improving pupil outcomes by looking at, at areas in which they're failing. So we're really, really trying to make a, a big, as much of an impact as we can as possible in terms of improving outcomes in schools. And because we span content, curriculum and assessment, and also technology, we're in quite a unique position to really contribute in a positive way, we hope, to the discussions that are taking place at the moment about school improvement. And so it's an exciting time for, for us at Pearson to see really how we can contribute to these debates and, and use our strengths to really take things forward. So to get to the heart of what I wanted to talk about today, um, we believe that really the overt focus on buildings and facilities, and particularly um, leaders in terms of school improvement, has missed out this third piece of the jigsaw, which um, I want to call knowledge transfer. But you know, it's a very woolly term, so what do we really mean by knowledge transfer? And what I want to do is draw on some of my own past experience as a teacher to give you some idea of what kind of impact this can have on improving outcomes in schools. Now, I lectured in both the universities of Cambridge and Aberystwyth 
They're both outstanding universities, but very, very different. Now, Cambridge has some of the most gifted students in the world probably going into it in terms of its, its intent. But much of the student experience in Cambridge, if you ask undergraduates, is highly determined by individual tutors that they come into contact with, how inspirational those particular tutors can be, which areas they direct them in in terms of their learning, and how they choose to support their learning in that context. And while this can have fantastic outcomes for some, for some students, what you don't always get in that context is a base level across all students in terms of how education is delivered, the sorts of support structures and information that is made available to them, and the sort of the frameworks, if you like, which um, is a word that a couple of people have been mentioning, that support learning in a variety of different contexts. Now, the other thing that, that Cambridge on the whole doesn't do is it doesn't support lecturers taking uh, and doing what's called the PGCTHE, which for those of you that don't know, it's the teacher training qualification that you do if you want to practice in higher education. There's a distinct belief in Cambridge that gifted researchers will necessarily be gifted teachers and therefore you can spend your time doing your research and of course you will be able to disseminate it in a very interesting fashion to the pupils. So this is not always the case, as uh, the gentleman in front said. Now, contrasting this with Aberystwyth, which has a very mixed intake of students, it has some very, very bright children that come in with straight A's, but it also has young people that are coming in maybe with two B's and C, two C's, or maybe lower grades. And what I noticed in Aberystwyth, which I found very, very interesting, were the support structures that were available to young lecturers such as myself going into the system were incredibly well developed. They both sponsored you doing your postgraduate certificate of teaching in higher education and made space for you to actually undertake that qualification. But then the university had also invested time in creating structures for reporting feedback, both in terms of you giving feedback to students and students giving you feedback about your teaching. There were very clearly defined procedures and processes for reporting problems or indeed for how you should design learning and teaching outcomes. And what these structures and processes of knowledge transfer and actually in actual fact enabled were most students to get at least a base level of quality uh, delivery in terms of their education rather than it being so dependent on the individual strengths or weaknesses of particular university lecturers. Now, this is one simple example that I'm not going to take forward really any further. But what I think it's an indication of is the profound impact that knowledge transfer can actually have in terms of outcomes in education. And if you can find ways to identify, to define, to decode, to sort of capture, disseminate, and then embed in institutions ways for knowledge tra for transfer to take place so that you can actually improve the base level of learning that's going on for all students, then I think this can have a profound impact in terms of improving outcomes in schools. And so rather than schooling being dependent on facilities or individual teachers, what we're really interested in looking at at Pearson is how we can bring our scope in terms of our competencies, in terms of content, assessment curriculum, um, and, and, and learning technologies, how we can bring those together with understanding how knowledge is transferred in schools to facilitate improvement across the board for, for all, um, all pupils in, in all types of school. Very much. Thank you. Finally, Duncan. Thank you very much, Natalie, and um, it's a pleasure to be here in particular um, uh, to join John on this panel, who uh, I first met when uh, uh, delivering his uh, election leaflet yeah. in Oxford <laughs> some 14 years ago. Uh, so uh, those those Oxford PPE graduates do have their uses. <laughs> 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 If you listen to, to, to what John has been saying, um, we actually have a lot in common in terms of uh, how we're approaching uh, these questions, uh, more so than, than necessarily the, uh, uh, the conflicting positions by the time they reach the, the debating hall this morning uh, suggest. And I think it's quite helpful uh, to start with to, to remind colleagues here of uh, what the Liberal Democrat Manifesto said at this election. Uh, which was that Liberal Democrats want an education system where all schools will have the freedom to innovate, not be dictated to by central government. And I, I think that that remains uh, an objective that all of us can share, and the discussion comes about how we go about it. Um, but um, if, I, if I reflect on this morning's debate for a moment, uh, 
it, it sits in a context which I, I've learned since getting to Parliament of, of the difference between government and opposition. Because in government, you, you, you take the situation as it is and you ask yourselves, how can we do this better? Um, and good Liberal Democrat policymakers would do that in opposition too. Uh, but in the day-to-day -day cut and thrust of political debate in opposition, what you do is you listen to what is being suggested and you are as imaginative as you can be about all the things which might go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so it is very much a difference between uh, approaching a problem full of hope or full of fear. And, and it's right that we should identify risks of what could go wrong, uh, as indeed the conference uh, motion did this morning. Uh, because it's our job now in government to try and make sure that we mitigate those as far as possible or indeed uh, prevent them uh, from happening. Uh, but um, uh, the, the, the question that we're asking ourselves today about uh, school autonomy uh, uh, leading to improvement uh, is one for which there is actually quite a lot of uh, empirical support. And um, I think you've got to ask yourselves, um, you know, whether our coalition partners generally would be pursuing this if they didn't think it would be making a helpful uh, difference. Uh, over a third of the academies uh, with GCSE results in 2009 uh, have, have seen uh, an increase of more than 15 percentage points in their 5A star to C GCSE grades. Uh, the uh, National Audit Office report uh, last year uh, observed that many academies had improved faster than uh, equivalent maintained schools with a similar intake. <coughs> And a PwC report into uh, five years of academies in 2008 uh, uh, found that there was no evidence of a negative impact in terms of um, the profile of pupils on neighbouring schools to academies. Um, so um, we, we don't we don't enter this policy area uh, blind. Uh, but um, uh, from my point of view, it's not just about school improvement uh, in a purely league table statistical sense actually about making sure uh, that every child is able to fulfill their promise. And um, uh, we as Liberal Democrats have got a very clear set of policies led by the pupil premium for how we're going to make sure that children from the poorest backgrounds, for whom there is plenty of evidence that they're not fulfilling their promise, will be supported to do so. But I don't go about politics and policy making from the point of view of saying, um, that we should only seek to help some. And, and I think it is wrong of some critics of the new academy converters to, um, uh, as some of them have sounded like they will, certainly in the debates in the House of Commons, to object to improvements in schools which are very good. Um, because, and you know, I went to a, a very good uh, state comprehensive school, but there were uh, students at that school um, that were not fulfilling their promise. And uh, just because that was a very good school didn't mean to say that there shouldn't be a drive to continuously improve. Uh, uh, as liberals, we support schools having freedom, I think because uh, innovation uh, requires freedom. You need to be free to innovate. We don't believe that one size fits all. And so you need to ask yourselves, if you're not going to support great autonomy in schools, how are you going to foster the kind of innovation that can lead uh, to improvement? Um, uh, in fact, um, I think the last thought that I, I will leave you with before we go into Q&A uh, is perhaps maybe Liberals should approach this question slightly differently. Not simply to ask how will school autonomy lead to, lead to school improvement, but whether school improvement requires all schools to be denied autonomy. Um, and certainly that is, that is how I would start to address such questions. Uh, and um, and I'll, I'll leave you to chew on that one, as no doubt we'll get some feedback on that. Um, and, um, and I hope that, um, finally, that, that, that we'll be looking at this in the context of other interventions which we're making uh, to, to make sure that it is all schools that are able to improve uh, and not just uh, a, a small sum. Great. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to all our panellists. Lots of food for thought there. Um, as we said, we've got time for a Q&A, so if you'd like to um, raise your hands, if you'd like to say, have a question, could you just say who you are and where you're from as well before asking? So, start with Jennifer at the front. Uh, my name is Nicholas Smith uh, from uh, Cambridge, just graduated, uh, also half Swedish, um, so uh, perhaps the first-hand knowledge. Although, that's actually the point I'd like to make, that uh, 
the debate that we've been having, especially in the press, and I'm afraid to say also this morning at the conference, has been very insular on. Uh, it's been all about what we're worried might happen here in England. And it's, it's the language of risks, may, and a, a, a lot of a lot of, sort of assumptions. Mm -hmm. Whereas, and, and most of the, the only discussion of evidence that there was was either of some free school applications that have been made, or some existing academies, or um, one or two studies in Sweden that were mentioned. Um, and it may surprise some people to learn that free schools have actually been around for over 150 years, uh, being first founded in Denmark in 1852, um, which would indicate to me that they have come to the end of their charm period. <laughs> um, and I, I do, I'd like to just ask a fairly open-ended question. Why is it that it seems that in the newspapers, which are obsessed with anecdotal evidence, well, more fundamental data, and uh, in, in the political debate that we've been ignoring evidence uh, and quite a lot of evidence from America, although that is occasionally mentioned, usually the Obama's <coughs> quotation that the Guardian gave. Um, and also from New Zealand, uh, which uh, actually is directly relevant to uh, uh, social division in that when catchment areas were abolished in New Zealand, low-income families are more likely to send their children to a school outside their former catchment area than middle or high income families, which does suggest that social capital isn't actually a prerequisite for benefiting from more choice. Well, thank you. Well, Rachel, would you like to kick off with that one? I think it's a very good question, and actually, I'd add to that some, some evidence here. Uh, CMPO, which is the big sort of economic research thing in, in Bristol, did some very interesting research recently in which they looked at the difference between what are called reve uh, revealed preferences and expressed mm -hmm. preferences for people in low income backgrounds. So, if you ask people from low-income backgrounds what they look for in school, it looks as though they look for very different things from people from middle-class backgrounds. When you look at the schools they actually choose, given the preferences available to them, they go for exactly the same things. So I think actually um, the, the evidence in this country as well as others is that when you give people the options to go for different schools, and I will talk again about charters where you see people from very, very poor ethnic minority back, uh, backgrounds literally queuing around the block for hours in order to put their names down for new schools. Um, people who are from poor backgrounds are not stupid and, and they also go for those options. Um, I'm probably going to add a facetious remark to that and I think the reason is because journalists tend to have done history and not economics so they're not that interested. I'm sorry. So, um, <laughs> so I apologise and there are other well, words I'm not not sure which are very different um, in this room. <laughs> Um, well, I um, I was furnished with uh, Nicholas's paper, which I know you're interested in. It, um, uh, is is a well-researched piece uh, on an evidence check. Um, uh, I think it's I think it's right to say uh, it's a fair criticism of uh, the way the political debate takes place um, that it issues evidence, and, and I think that is partly because the media like uh, anecdotal stories. They like something which is you know homely and accessible. Um, and, and it's, it's a challenge for us. I, I think the other, the other, another thing to bear in mind about that is, unlike you know, dutiful researchers, uh, you know, politicians are um, you know, members of parliament. They are invariably generalists in the first instance. And you know, part of the way our representative democracy works is that we ask them to draw on experiences of their constituencies uh, and indeed their own, and bring those to. Uh, add insights into the debate, and I won't do it now, but I, I might do that on some of the later questions. Great. Nice. Can I, sorry, oh, sorry, to, John. Sorry. Sorry, just a couple of comments. I think that um, teachers prefer to cite Finland rather than Sweden. Uh, Finland comes out very close to the top of a number of the international studies. Uh, most of them want to run away from citing Singapore, which is a much more centralised state but also performs within the confines of its education system quite well. So I think the problem with comparative education is uh, people pick what suits them best. Uh, what we have to do is to work from the sort of society that we've got in this country and the evidence-based problems to actually work, which is a village trust, to actually identify what within those contexts will actually encourage people <coughs> to achieve the goal they want. And I worked, my first job was in a uh, inner city comprehensive in Tottenham. It was so bad that it was uh, merged. But I'm proud to say that I got the first pupil, 
seven years I was there, the only people who went to Cambridge to read geography. Um, and we should have done an awful lot more for those children. They are still being <coughs> failed by the system at present. And the, the children who were failed when I was teaching nearly 40 years ago, 40 years ago this January, are still being failed. And if we come up with some solutions that use people and inspiration and the modern technology to actually crack that, we will have given a legacy to the future. But we've got to do it in such a way that focuses most on that. And I'm slightly worried that there is a danger that the conservative end of the coalition is actually not understanding that part of the argument as strongly as I have a group of parents and I want to set up a school. I think actually to add to that, I mean, the pupil premiums we mentioned, the pupil premium is clearly essential to all of that. Yeah. And it's something that we still don't know anything about. The government hasn't announced how much money is there that's going to be, how it's going to be allocated. But if you want, and this is again something that's happened in, in, in America, although it's called Taiwan funding that, um, if you want to make sure that people both are happy the resources to do the most in those deprived areas, but also make sure that that's where they are going to and setting up schools, the pupil premium is completely essential. But we've got to use the pupil premium money properly. There's no point giving lots more money to schools if they don't make effective use of this. And that's where the knowledge transfer yeah. and the other things come in. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, it's only got a handful. Okay, I'm going to take a couple of questions. Gentlemen there, and then if I take Maybe there, but if you go first, we'll answer a couple at a time if that's all right. Uh, thanks, Natalie. Uh, Martin Johnson from ATL, the Education Union, and actually my question or observation leads on, from, I think, from the last remark I want to do. Um, ask the panel about the policy dilemma around autonomy. Um, but before I ask the question, I'm, just, um, I'm always reminded when we're talking about autonomy uh, that when the, the previous highly over regulating government. Uh, decided at one time that it was going to give uh, particularly good schools the right to innovate and invited applications from schools to, uh, if you like, disregard regulation. They, it turned out that over 19 out of 20 uh, applications were for things which schools were already permitted to do. <laughs> I just leave you to reflect on that. Now, um, uh, but the, 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 the policy dilemma about autonomy, can I refer to the pupil premium policy, which is clearly a, you know, one, a, a policy which ATL supports um, and could make a difference. But because uh, the government uh, believes in uh, uh, having a bonfire of regulations, it, has, it, it, it plans not to specify how the pupil premium shall be spent nor to monitor how it is spent. And therefore, schools are not going to be under any leverage to spend that money on the pupils for whom it is designed. And that encapsulates the dilemma about, uh, uh, about, uh, about autonomy, because if schools aren't, aren't subject to leverage on that, they are subject to leverage on many, many other things. And in fact, I expect many of you are ahead of me already. If schools get extra money and nothing else changes, they're going to spend it on CD borderline, secondary schools are going to spend it on CD borderline kids to improve their league table position. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so to everyone on the panel, really, uh, it seems to me at the heart of making autonomy work for the poorest and most private in society, admissions policy have got to be at the heart of that. And again, it's something that, that might, sort of, you know, could become sort of very bureaucratic and, and regulatory. But it seems to me, you know, to avoid cream skewing, to avoid the sort of problems John talked about, then you have to have some form, perhaps what I'm suggesting Bernardo has made recently about you know, fair banding, but something needs to be put down to make sure that these schools are serving uh, a representative range of society. Okay. Would you like to get off here? Would you like to touch on any of your first two points? Um, I think the issue about admissions policies is, is very interesting. Based on my own experience, the wider mix of pupils that you can have in a school actually can create a far more dynamic learning environment. Um, 
partially because it improves the chances of people from less advantaged backgrounds to see children do well and to aspire to actually achieve those things themselves because they come into to very close proximity with it. But it's also in terms of how schools run and how people, how teachers teach and how, how you manage processes in schools. So I mean, I would be in, in full agreement of that uh, in giving schools greater autonomy, autonomy, there has to be some engagement with admissions processes and how they take place and how you, you create schools that are representative of the communities in which, in which they are embedded rather than them becoming uh, more selective in terms, not necessarily in terms of the academic ability, but in terms of the profile of the students that they want to attract in terms of their interests or, or whatever that may be. Um, now, one of the ways that um, I suppose we're interested in, in looking at that in, in Pearson is by rather than focusing explicitly on academic or vocational forms of learning, what we would be very keen to encourage is that you can get far more mixed schools in terms of the pupils that come into them by promoting uh, a very strong le and high level standards in both of those areas, partially because it's that's because we believe that to be dynamic rounded learners you actually need to have skills in both of those areas, but it would also be a, a goal for us to do that to achieve a mixed group of people within to schools to create that sort of school school environment. So that doesn't answer your exact question, but in terms of touching on some of the issues that I think admissions policies, how you deal with admissions policies, how you get a mix of pupils in school and what that can help create in school, I hope that that sort of expands on some of those points. John? Yeah, I, the admissions policy is very difficult because we're governed by uh, the accidents of geography and history. And it's also occasionally a bit of a pallet because it takes the argument away from the main problem, which is we have responsibility for every child that is going through a public funded education system. We have a responsibility to do our best to achieve the highest quality education for every child in that system. Um, Peter used the analogy of stores in his opening speech this morning. Um, if you've got a chain, and it's true of the KIPP schools as well, you don't say, well, okay, the standards in this branch will be that, the standards in that branch will be somewhat lower, because I'll tolerate something that's less good there. You achieve the same brand standard across the whole lot. Why are we not going for achieving the same standard of the best possible education, however you want to define it, it may be defined in different ways for different people, for everybody. I mean, would it be acceptable, and it's not acceptable to some people, to say, okay, we'll give you very high quality vocational education because you're in the 50% that's not going to go to university. But in doing so, if you have the capability to go to university, knowing that your family's been to university, we're still going to make you a hairdresser because that's what you want to do at 12. It's a, yeah, it's a really complex situation. And sometimes I think the whole debate about admissions policy and everything else deflects us from the real issue, which is if these schools are underperforming or if they are middle class schools that are coasting, then we have got to find a mechanism. Martin's quite right. We've got to find a mechanism that challenges those schools in a non-threatening way. The best organizations do not come in and inspect with threatening inspectors who put you in fear of your job. That's a wonderful 19th century Fordian factory model of society. The, the best thing that we ever had uh, in the early days of the last Conservative government, which they then got rid of, were things like advisory teachers, who were efficient classroom practitioners who came out of their classrooms and went and worked in other schools to <coughs> transfer their expertise in a normal threatening way. But those schools were working in cooperation with each other. As soon as you got competition, people didn't want to do that. Um, I sort of do and don't agree with both points. Um, on admissions, I completely agree that you need to make sure that these schools are properly inclusive admissions policies. But I sort of also agree with John. I think <coughs> sometimes in the debate about admissions, um, we sort of almost get to a point where we say there's no such thing as a good school or a bad school. There's only a school with a particular intake. And I think that's completely wrong. Um, I think that great teachers and inspirational models and brilliant leadership can completely transform schools with a given intake. 
and that by obsessing too much about the precise nature of the emissions policy, you deflect attention from that, which is that you can do a fantastic job or a less fantastic job in a given school. Um, on the people premium, I think there's a difference between regulating and monitoring. Um, you know, I, I'm sure we can all imagine a lot of cases in which you could do something very useful with the pupil premium, which would massively increase standards for those people who are coming in from less imagined free school meal backgrounds, but would also help others, whether that's a new teacher or a different kind of teacher. And if you read, you can also easily imagine a kind of regulation which means that you can't do those things because it's not only targeted at those peoples. So I think it is important to see how the people premium is being spent, and it is most important to make sure that schools are improving standards. But I wouldn't want to really regulate precisely how it was spent. Okay, I'll try and be quick. Uh, on, on the first one um, about the pupil premium, uh, uh, Martin, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of the shortcomings with the link table system and the kind of distortions uh, that that can create. I think that is a, a fair point. Um, uh, but I, I don't think the right uh, response to that is one in which central government regulates how the pupil premium is spent. I would hope that we will see, not unlike that we have seen in some cases with statements to children, uh, some uh, you know, uh, inevitable accountability uh, for how additional funds are spent uh, within those schools and in their relationships with parents. Um, and you know, time, will, time will tell once we've introduced the pupil premium whether that's one of the consequences of that policy. Uh, on admissions, uh, I, th I think the proposals around fair banding are, are very interesting and um, uh, I'm sure there will be some areas in the country that given the opportunity would be interested in you know, piloting and trialling that, particularly where current, the current system is really at its most strength. I am conscious, however, that in other parts of the country um, this is not such an issue and uh, causing a, a lot of upheaval un unnecessarily and that isn't invited. Um, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be a good idea, uh, certainly uh, un unless those changes have, subs have already been proven elsewhere. Uh, I mean, we heard some uh, accounts of issues with secondary transfer in the debate this morning uh, and um, uh, in areas that I'm familiar with. Uh, in Wiltshire, we don't have anything like that trouble, and that's partly due to geographical reasons, I think. <laughs> so we need to recognise that in different parts of the country, uh, admissions is, is more of an issue than, than in others. Uh, and finally, what I'd say about admissions is that um, I agree with John uh, that um, we should be interested in how all pupils get on, and therefore getting into a debate which says, you know, let's make it all right for my children and, and recognise that some people it's not going to be okay for them. It is, you know, isn't really progress, um, uh, but uh, I think admissions is relevant in so far as actually achieving a, a, a more genuine social mix with the schools uh, can actually be beneficial to all schools concerned. Um, and so, the sort of ideas that um, the Secretary of State was floating just just the other week around uh, academies having the freedom to select four free school meals is I think one which um, is, is very interesting and one which addresses some of the concerns that people had at the time that the bill was going through. Certainly in, in Chippenham, uh, the new uh, academy uh, that has converted this term is a school that when I was researching Lib Dem policy prior to the election was one which had a lot of free school meal pupils relative to other schools in my constituency and didn't conform to the stereotype that some critics would have us believe that it was only those middle, most middle class schools that, that were looking to embrace these freedoms. Great. Okay, we'll do a couple more rounds of questions. I'll take that lady there and then lady at the front here. So I'm Kate Williams. I'm from Treehouse, which is an autism education charity. Um, as well as campaigning to improve education for young people with autism, we run a school in North London for children with autism. Um, and it, the school was set up by parents, so we sort of have a bit of experience with the whole free school model ourselves. But the key point that the founding parents always say to me is they only did it because there wasn't another option, because education for children with special educational needs generally is quite poor, particularly for people with autism at the moment. So my question was about, um, with, all the, with all the freedom to innovate in academies, how do we make sure that children with special educational needs still get the support they need? Because whilst, like, like Duncan, I'm hopeful about it, what the results do show from the old style of academies is that it's children with special educational needs that didn't do well. 
under that system. The National Order Office report showed that they actually did progress as well. So I'm keen to hear from the panel what they think we can do for people with special education needs. Um, I'm Helen Flynn of Education Campaign and I also stood in class election for the Skipton and Ripon Club. Um, quite a complex argument I want to put before you really, but if you can show in a consistent way that school autonomy does lead to um, school improvements, um, and if you have a government which has an overall goal, which I hope any government would, of providing the best education possible for every person in the country, then why do we seem to be continuing to add to the diversity of school structure in the, the uh, country, which means that you are going to get diverse outcomes because the, if, you, if you have too much choice, then groups will proliferate around choices and other groups will miss out. That just seems to be the case. And we can demonstrate that through, through lots of evidence that's come out about sociological outcomes um, from education. So what I'm interested in as, as Liberal Democrats is whether we should, rather than look at structure, look at models of education and possibly think to try and get one model of education, which could be that every school is an academy and or it has an academy type model where there is autonomy in the leadership structure you have great professionalization of teachers and like john was saying you know like teachers have <coughs> shops then you have a rigorous scrutiny level which could be the la or could be someone else but why are we forever adding on and adding on and adding on to different structures in, in society, when if we look at our, our goals, our common goals, then we have to find ways of achieving those goals. And I think at the moment it's just <coughs> far too complex. So it's really this idea about having one model, but having it kind of teacher driven. In a sense, teachers come into both those two questions, both Kate and Heavens. Uh, my biggest anxiety about the special school sector is that we don't have a significant career development program for anybody who wants to go into that department. And that one of the things that the government takes its eyes off is doing it, I hope it will address is how we're going to get the next generation of people who are working with children with special education needs. Because frankly, I have no idea where they're coming from. And I'm appalled that one in 10 people who work in people referral units are instructors and therefore totally unlicensed and fall into that general teaching council category of unlicensed teachers and they are some of our most challenged individuals the specialist disciplines like autism hearing and vision impaired and others we've got a serious crisis of where we're going to get the next group of teachers for and i quite understand why you as well and your previous bunch of parents would have set that up i think my, my problem with the whole school system is I want to be clear where the strategic planning for the vision underlying the purpose of education is coming from. Within that, I don't know that a thousand flowers can bloom, but it may be possible that there may be a range of different possibilities because people will want to do things in different ways. What we do know is that where our school has a strong ethos, well, frankly it doesn't seem matter what that ethos is, it will succeed when, it, when it's got weak leadership, no ethos, nobody knows why they're there, and they're doing it for the money, then it doesn't succeed. And I think how you get that in a state system mandated down from the top probably also involves the Secretary of State giving clear leadership of what the purpose of the education system is. And I'm quite clear about pupil premium because I wrote for Willis's uh, spokesperson's paper, No Child Left Behind that built on the original Nick Clegg visit to the Netherlands about this. Some children need more resources, whether they're autistic, whether they are just coming without the benefit of the social capital from the home to achieve, particularly at the start of the schooling, even more than later on. But I think a lot of the focus is on secondary schools because they shout louder. Not sometimes enough focus on what goes on earlier on, although we have switched the argument towards early years we can actually get people to understand that those resources are being spent to ensure 
that those children who need more. It's a notion of equality. Is your notion of equality the one that one of the teacher associations, not Martin, once wanted, which was we have the same amount of money for everybody? And that whether I'm in a, a rural county or a urban area, I have the same amount of money. What you do with that money is then up to you. Or is it that actually some children need a different amount of application or learning resources to achieve what we consider to be the various goals as you go through the education system. And that's the notion of equality that the pupil premium, that I understand it, is actually based upon. And one of the things I hope that Sarah and Michael Gove will do is actually sell that notion. Because then you have to worry about the regulation the part of it. But if you don't sell it, people don't know why they've got this money. And the alternative is to do what the Labour Party did, which is top-down centralisation. And let me give you just two examples of how that failed. One was the one that David Blunkett came in with, which was key stage one class sizes of 30. It had a significant transfer of money from the inner city areas to conservative local authorities. Because most of the inner city areas already got their class sizes at key stage one down below 30. And Barnet and Bexley and Bromley and some of these other local authorities had them. And they benefited brilliantly. Exactly the same thing happened in California when they did it in Los Angeles. There was a flight of qualified teachers who lived in the suburbs from the inner cities to go and work in the schools. They'd always wanted a job. And exactly the same problem happened when they gave them money and said, spend it on teaching assistants. There is conflicting evidence about whether effectively doubling the workforce in primary schools by putting in a huge number of teaching assistants has actually improved the quality of learning. Whereas what I get the message from Every Child a Reader and the one-to-one -one scheme over the last couple of years is please don't end that because it gives us the money with a target and our choice of how we use it. And that's what schools seem to like. So professional freedom to produce the results driven by a system. And it would be easier if we were in New Zealand and a country which had a social hegemony. We haven't got that. We are a much more divided society. And we need to be able to bring it together. And that is part of the role of central government. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, I have a question for Kate, actually. I, I might have missed the point. Did you say you were a, it was a primary school or a secondary school? It's both. We do children from the age of four up to 19, but about 90 people at the minute. Ah, okay. Because one of the things that we found in terms of the research that we've been doing is um, increasingly people are citing Finland, as I think John did earlier, as an example of, of, of best practice in terms of how you can improve education. And one of the reasons for this, um, that, that Finland is considered to have such such good outcomes, is because of the focus that they put on primary education in terms of targeting resources, particularly for people who have got special education needs. So that rather than leaving uh, sort of higher systems, if you like, like secondary education or higher education or FE to, to, to deal with problems, if you can actually invest time and money and specialist attention at primary level, you can begin to address some of these needs uh, earlier on. And I think there is a broader responsibility of the education community to begin to think about primary, secondary and higher and further education in a more joined up way. We have a tendency to conceptualise them as sort of silos where things take place sort of independently of each other. Whereas if you can begin to see them more as part of a, a, a sort of an integrated system, you can begin to channel resources, people, premium monies, however you want to do it, into key points that can really impact on longer term uh, development. And part of it is special education needs, which is obviously the, the area of your school. But I think in a broader sense, it's about targeting resources in terms of English and maths and ensuring that all pupils have got that as, as a basic level of, of, of numeracy and literacy, as a basic level, level of competency, before they then start getting exposed to wider subject matter 11 and beyond, which they can really, you know, can be completely beyond their ability if they haven't actually gone through very clear steps, steps to enable them to, to reach a particular, particular level. And I think part of what I'm talking about when I talk about knowledge transfer is de developing these mechanisms and structures and frameworks to enable that you can both identify those who have the greatest need, but then also provide them with the support and the resources and the tailored individual forms of learning that can really nurture them at an early stage and help them make progression through a system, whatever their outcome might be. It doesn't have to be going to 
um, you know, to, to Cambridge or somewhere like that. It could be going off and just to develop, you know, developing the confidence to, to act as an independent adult. And I think it's in that primary part of your, your development that it's really important to begin to think about those things. And I think if we can think about kindergarten to year 12 forms of education, or maybe even kindergarten to 21, so you're actually taking learners throughout that learning process and helping them develop. I think that would be a really positive way of approaching uh, thinking about learning more generally. So, uh, yeah, um, and I said, we're actually being contacted by an increasing number of groups who are sort of like yours, who want to set up um, new special schools. And um, special education is one of the areas where, as you said, there have been a number of independent special schools set up, and which are doing a fantastic job. Um, however, I do think something from the experience we've talked to them, and I'd be very interested to talk to you more about this, that there, there's a real problem in terms of the funding system and the way in which SEM funding works. And there are you know, an increasing number of heartbreaking stories about parents whose children were desperately unhappy in the education they were in, or were suicidal, very badly bullied, found a setting that was right for them, and they couldn't get to it, get tied up in judicial reviews. And I think it's something that is crucial to change, because just as you know, something that the child schools have done and what I think new schools will do is allowing teachers to sort of use their energy and their inspiration to set up new schools and make a massive difference to people who really need it. There are simply a lot of people who want to do that in SEN and it's too difficult. Um, and I think it's something that the government really needs to change um, if they're going to make the impact on, on children in SEN and particularly that kind of spectrum um, that they possibly could. Um, on, on your point on structures, um, I sort of distinguish between two things. I think you're right, there's a slight excessive proliferation of different legal structures for schools and it's very confusing and, it, and it's sort of a historical accident and sort of laying on top of each other I think it probably would be sensible to have a slightly simpler system. Um, but I do think it is important that you give the opportunity for people to set up fantastic new schools which can make a big difference and I think it is important to recognise that not the same school suits every child. As a model you could still set up a, a new school which would be you know, say an academy structure yeah, with, with uh, one legal structure. That's with the same one, one structure. I think that would be very sensible. And, and under oversight of, of, of that was what I'm saying. Yeah, I think that would be extremely sensible. Um, whether they'll do it or not, I don't know. But um, <laughs> uh, I think you're right that you know most people probably don't know if they're applying to a trust, a foundation, or a academy or anything else, but it is very confusing and probably unnecessarily so. I think your point about SCN really reflects something. I mean, 20 years ago, I did some work for the RNIB, and there was a very strong parent lobby that's a group of articulate parents, both in the, the visually handicapped and in some of the others, actually what they wanted at that moment in time was integration. They did not want separate development. Um, and attitudes change to some of these things. Education systems are inevitably for the long term if they're in, in the public funding. And it's how we marry together and change in attitudes, change in technology, changes in the way we do things in a very large, cumbersome public system with the, the elephant in the room that nobody's mentioned, which is, of course, that we are now in an age of austerity. Mm -hmm. If we were three years ago and we were at the, the top of the economic cycle, we would all be much more enjoying ourselves about saying how we could do all these things. Yeah, we are regrettably not in that position. And the difficult decisions that people are going to have to make is how do we use public money in the most cost-effective way to achieve the largest amount of success for the greatest number of people? If we don't do that, our public stewardship has to come into question. Right. Ooh, sorry. sorry. No, I'm going to cut in. We've got a very last round of questions. Can you please keep them extremely snappy, as I will be asking our panellists to keep them very snappy. So we'll take these three, but as I say, no lectures, please. Short questions. No lectures, just a brief thanks to Pearson, the Urban Book Trust, and I just want to say that the book time programme is fantastic, really wonderful books. Encouraging teachers to talk to parents about books and reading, and and share reading, so fantastic scheme. But I want to come back to parental involvement. It's absolutely critical. All the evidence, Professor De Forge, parental involvement is one of the key things to higher achievement. How would this, um, and I think the debate around preschools is very interesting, how are we going to ensure that all parents are going to get supported so that there's a real community of support for parents and learning okay. for the new system? Great, thank you. Sorry, yeah, yes. yeah, um, I'm Andrew Bridgewater. Um, <clears throat> it's been fairly mentioned the crucial role of effective governance 
and improving standards in what have been for many years largely autonomous schools. Can I have some comments about how it should improve and if it isn't, why not? Thank you. And Lady Nixon. Uh, I'm Emma Knight, the National Governors Association. So I was going to ask the question. <laughs> the fact that you've asked it first allows me to make <laughs> comments about language because an awful lot of rhetoric is thrown about at the moment in the education debate and we're not really clear what we mean by things. We talk about freedoms. Actually, it's our governing bodies that have to decide whether or not schools want to convert to academies. So governors have been looking really, really hard at what this means. And by and large, we can't find a lot of freedoms that we don't already have. And I think that we're, we're throwing these words around. We're not controlled by local authorities. Actually, governing bodies are accountable. Okay, bodies. I'm kind of sorry, cut yeah. you off there. Right, so last comment from the panel again before we'll keep it snappy. John, would you like to kick off? Yep, governance is important, and I know that Andrew is chairing a working party that is looking into it on behalf of the party. Anybody who wants to talk to him about it, I'm sure he'd be delighted to talk to you. Um, parental support, yep, Jack Tizard, I was working in Haringey when he was doing his work which showed even where parents came from a different culture and a different language, did not themselves understand English, sitting down with their young child, listening to them read, produced better results than improving the pupil-teacher ratio or anything else. How, you know, this is where we don't use advertising for education. No, we, the only advertising we do is to advertise for teachers. And the TDO stopped that and got the money. Yeah, the advertising the benefits of education in those places where hard to reach people are using the modern methods of communication might actually pay us some dividends cost effectively. Okay, Kate. Uh, yeah, one first point I'd like to make is, is a distinction, I suppose, between parental involvement and parental engagement in terms of education. Parental involvement is what people talk about a lot of the time, and I'm not criticising you for using that, that, that word, but it often means parents coming into schools and maybe participating in coffee mornings and that kind of thing. There's a very different agenda, which is parent engagement, which is engaging parents in how children learn. And I think a key part of what we're hoping to do in terms of Pearson is if, if you can begin to create clearer frameworks about how knowledge is transferred, that's not just internally within a school, it's also about reaching out beyond the classroom into spaces where children learn and co-opting the people who are in control of those spaces in terms of how you can actually use those spaces uh, more creatively in terms of you know children spending more time on learning. So I'm in complete support of it as is Pearson. Um, to, to address the issue about effective governance in, in uh, schools, which I think are the two questions from the back, um, I, d I don't think all schools are effective in terms of their governance and uh, one of the things I think that many schools, I mean from my experience in the private sector, um, we experience wild fluctuations in terms of governance and one of the things that you're seeing increasingly in the private sector are federations of school coming, schools coming together so they can share best practice in terms of governance. Now, I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility for this to become far more common in terms of how the state sector functions, both in terms of free schools and in terms of the, the wider, wider state sector. What there needs to be greater understanding of is best practice in terms of governance, how you constitute governance, uh, how, how it actually becomes embedded in the schools, not simply in terms of rhetoric, but in terms of practice. And again, um, although much of what I've spoken about today has been about the educational benefits of knowledge transfer. I think in a much broader sense, if you want schools to really maximise improvements in terms of education outcomes, it's how the whole school functions and, and, and you know, from, from a governance perspective as well as from a uh, knowledge transfer perspective in, in the classroom. So. Great, thank you, Rachel. Uh, yeah, just very quickly, um, parental engagement, I completely agree, but as a sort of cautionary note, I do think we have to be slightly careful about not expecting schools to fix every social problem out there. Um, and there are, you know, schools can make a massive effort, but there is an extent to which they are schools, and you do need to look at other things across sort of the, the whole policy spectrum to, to fix other problems. Um, so sort of governance and the things that generally, and it's being picked up in various ways, one of the things we haven't talked about really, um, which is very important when you are having autonomy, is information. And there are all sorts of ways in the education sector, whether it's information to professionals, information for parents, um, even information to government, where we don't know enough about what is going on. Um, and what we can do, what we can't do, and parents don't have enough information about what schools are doing. So I think that's something, another thing that's very important for government to be looking at. Brilliant. And Duncan. Okay, I'll try to be quick. Um, from the previous batch, uh, Kate, um, there was a lot of discussion about uh, special education needs during the passage of the Academy's Bill, 
Um, there's a lot of attention given to it uh, by my colleagues in the Lords in particular. Uh, one of the things it secured was a commitment from ministers that there should be uh, parity in terms of the duties of academies and the maintained sector. Um, uh, but there's a much broader review on SEM, and there's going to be a green paper uh, this autumn. I'm sure Sarah would be delighted if you were to contribute in the consultation that will follow from that. Um, and that's a really good opportunity for us to try and drive progress in areas where it's not, you know, it's not meeting the needs of certain pupils at the moment. Um, uh, Helen on one model for education there. I mean, there's a real tendency for policymakers to. Um, uh, it's, it's the train set tendency. It's normally us boys that fall foul of it to try and, to try and you know, get everything um, neat and tidy. Um, actually, the approach that the government's taking is it is being permissive, and a consequence of that is that not everyone is going to move to a new situation, uh, certainly not straight away. But I, I think I think um, it's a fair reflection of a lot of the comments from my colleagues, especially on the back benches in the demos. But the question, why can't all schools be academies in that case, was one that was articulated very frequently. And, and I, would, I would hope that as confidence grows, um, there, there may be uh, wider opportunities to, to extend that to, 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 to more schools. And there may be, it, it will be um, uh, clearer. I, the other thing to say is, in terms of um, uh, institutional entities, um, the free schools um, will be treated as academies once they've been established. I mean, they're, they're described differently because their origins are different, but you know, that's the way the legislation works. The legislation makes very little reference to free schools because once they're established, it treats them as academies. Um, uh, Viv, I think we've all agreed with you about uh, parent uh, in involvement. It does occur to me, though, in some of the debate about uh, free schools, some of the opposition um, uh, has, has taken quite a... a a snotty tone uh, about involvement of some parents in, in shaping the, the education of their children. And whatever the merits of the underlying arguments there, I really don't think that that has been helpful to encouraging uh, parental involvement. And finally, Andrew, um, uh, I think you'd have really liked my speech this morning at the Demos Fringe over breakfast. I'm sorry that um, uh, you weren't able to, but uh, as a school governor of eight years, I'm well aware of some of the shortcomings. Uh, and. and uh, in short, you know, we could do things like increasing the delegated uh, uh, spending limits for, for, for heads so that uh, school governors are spending less time in intricate uh, decisions about um, uh, spending, spending within the school and taking a more strategic role. And I did go along to your um, consultation at the beginning of conference, so um, I've, I've heard some of what colleagues have got to say about that, and, and I hope that your, your work um, provides some suggestions we can put to government. Great, well thank you all very much. I'd like to thank our panel to John, Rachel, Duncan and Kate, to Pearson for sponsoring and thank you all for coming along and asking a series of challenging questions. Thank you very much.